All right, so uh, thank you, the organizers. Thank you for everyone for sticking around to the end of the conference. I know that we're all getting to be a little tired at this point, probably, or maybe that's just because I stayed out too late last night. Um, so today I want to tell you guys about some work that I've been doing uh, trying to constrain the m star halo relation using the local group uh, Galaxy Counts. This is work that uh, we started with Emma Barbwell, who's an undergraduate at Case Western. And of course, James and Mike Bull and Colchin have been involved in this work as well. So let me start by taking a step back and show you how we've used the local group to try to inform abundance matching estimates in the past. Uh, so here I'm plotting Peter Beruzzi's 2013 abundance matching line. This uses a faint end log slope of about 1.4. Right? If we take this relationship and naively extrapolate it well below where Peter's data runs out uh, to the Elvis simulations, which as you guys have heard many times, are a suite of local group-like simulations, basically, the so Milky Way mass hosts, uh, then we get stellar mass functions that drastically overpredict uh, the local group stellar mass functions, even in the region where we think we're complete around the Milky Way and M31, so sort of between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6 in stellar mass. So we looked at this and we said, well, this doesn't look right at all. How can we fix this? So we went out into the literature and did some looking and found an updated uh, stellar mass function uh, from Baldry et al., the gamma survey, basically. And when we plug that into our, uh, the abundance matching formula that Peter has, we get a faint end slope here of about 1.9. So it falls off much more rapidly at, faint, at small stellar masses, small halo masses, sorry. If we, again, naively ex take this extrapolation and apply it to the Elvis suite, suddenly we get something that looks pretty good down to where we're incomplete. And you can say, okay, maybe this discrepancy here is either incompleteness or the fact that you have some cutoff in star formation or something like that. However, there's a big caveat to all of this, which is that both of these relations are assuming zero scatter in the abundance matching relationship, in the M star and halo relationship. But we know that's not right. We know that there's scatter at higher masses. Specifically, Peter uh, quotes 0.2 decades of scatter at all masses down to where his line basically runs out. And so we wanted to ask the question, what happens when you add scatter, and what is the scatter at the low mass end? Can we constrain that scatter with the local group? What are the implications of that large scatter? Does it do anything to say too big to fail? Will it change our predictions for quenching in any noticeable ways? Um, and finally, can the scatter that simulations, and I'll show you a plot at the end that really sort of drives this home, but if you look at all the simulations out there, the dwarf scale, there's a lot of scatter. Can that actually be correct? Will they correctly predict the local group if you were to run a Milky Way sized host? So um, here's our model, trying to move towards more realistic abundance matching by adding scatter. So what we're going to do is peg our line to Peter Beruzzi's down to roughly uh, the turnover, which is around the uh, LMC mass here, about 10 to the 11 in M halo and about 10 to the 9 in M star. Then we're going to let this faint end slope very freely. So essentially we're allowing this line to go like this or like this. Right, we, we let it do whatever it wants. We're then going to assume a symmetric log normal scatter that's also allowed to vary freely. Um, I'm going to be quoting the one standard deviation scatter in the rest of this work. Um, I want to make the point that we've tested a whole bunch of other models for the scatter. We've tested uh, one-sided scatter, scatter that blows up as you go down in M halo. Um, we've tested cutoffs in the star formation where you get no stars below 10 to the 9 uh, in halo mass. We've tested uh, models where you restrict nothing to lie above this baryon fraction times the halo mass. Turns out these things do ab very, very little, at least, to the general conclusions that I'm going to present. So I'm just going to show you the simplest model, basically. Um, so we have our model. What's our data? Uh, well, on the observational side, our data are the uh, stellar mass functions where we think we're complete. So in M31, we think we're complete down to about 10 to the 5 in the panda's footprint, which is the central 150 kiloparsecs or so of M31. In the Milky Way, we're going to assume that we're complete within 300 kiloparsecs, but only down to the faintest classical satellite, which is Draco. So that turns out to be about 5 times 10 to the 5. In the local field, we really have no idea. <laughs> but we're going to go ahead and hand wave and say it's something like 10 to the 7. We're going to use this as our cutoff, actually. I'm going to analyze the local field separately and not even actually show you the results. Uh, but it turns out that you get roughly the same answer if you use those. 
Now we're going to go ahead and throw away the two most massive satellites uh, in both the Milky Way and M31 for a couple reasons. One, uh, because our uh, halos, our simulated halos are biased uh, in that regard because we've tried to select systems that have Milky Ways, and, or sorry, that have LMCs and SMCs when picking the Elvis pairs. Um, and two, because we know that the LMC and SMC are relatively rare in cosmological simulations and in STSS. Again, if we don't do this step, not too much changes, but some of the numbers are going to change. So then what's our uh, theoretical data? Well, that's, of course, the Elvis halo counts. So here I'm just plotting the peak subhalo mass function, m peak. Um, so the largest that the subhalo ever was over its main branch. In cyan are the counts within 150 kiloparsecs, which will, of course, be compared to m31. And in black are the counts within 300 kiloparsecs. So um, how do we then figure out, once we take uh, these uh, halo mass functions, apply some M star and halo relation, add scatter to it, how do we then compare them to the actual galaxy counts? Well, I didn't know about the work that Frank was doing, so I made up my own statistic, which turns out to be pretty similar to Frank's. Um, so I'm going to use the statistic kappa, which is the average distance in log space between the ith most massive galaxy in the theory sample and in the data sample. So essentially, we're just taking the average spacing between these two lines. It's, again, it's pretty similar to what Frank does. So what this means is that a smaller kappa is better, right? Kappa of zero means they lie directly on top of each other. Um, because we're trying to minimize kappa, we're going to allow both the heavy host in each pair and the light host in each pair, the host of Milky Way or M31. And on a realization by realization basis, we're going to pick the one that works out best. Um, so here are our results, right? This is our general results here. Uh, color coding here is kappa, so blue is the best, right? Um, the white line is just showing you the absolute minimum, the best fit relation that you get. First thing you can take away is that it's completely degenerate between scatter and slope, right? So no, we can't constrain the scatter, unfortunately. We also can't constrain the slope, but we can constrain the two of them together. Um, the second thing, and this is probably not terribly surprising, um, you need a steeper slope as you turn your scatter up, right? And this is, we know that the subhalo mass function is rising pretty steeply, so you're going to have more objects that are small that scatter up than you'll have big objects that scatter down, right? So we need to have a steeper, scatter, a steeper slope in order to prevent overproducing a local group galaxy count. Now, like I said, we get similar results for the local field, but completeness is so poorly understood there that I'm not going to show you the, the actual results here. Qualitatively, they're the same. Quantitatively, they're roughly similar. So um, really quickly, I just want to illustrate one of these, or the two extreme cases, basically. So applied in black, here's Peter's line, again, extrapolated well beyond where his data exists. Um, the magenta line is our best fit relation when you have zero scatter. So this has a faint end log slope of about 1.8. And the cyan line is our best fit relation when you have two decades of scatter, which is an enormous amount of scatter. Um, and that has a faint end log slope of about 2.6. If we take these two relations and apply them to the Elvis simulations, and then we're just going to go ahead and stack the Milky Way and M31 together and make it look a little easier, um, what you can see is that we get roughly equal agreement between the cyan and the magenta lines, which of course compare these cyan and magenta lines. So, different slope and different scatter, we're getting something that looks just about as good. However, it's really important that you include the scatter. If you uh, take the same cyan relation here, but throw away the scatter, assume zero scatter, you drastically underproduce the Milky Way and M31 stellar mass functions. Conversely, if we were to take this magenta line and add two decades of scatter to it, we would drastically overproduce the Milky Way and M31 stellar mass functions. All right, so we've shown that you can turn the scatter up to two decades and get roughly the same uh, quality of fit to the Milky Way and M31 counts, um, similarly in the local field. But what does that actually mean? What does that imply for some problems in astronomy? Well, one of my favorite problems is too big to fail. Um, so, just to remind you, too big to fail basically says if we select subhalos by some measure that determines whether or not we think they'll form stars, typically this is V-peak or M-peak or something like that, the largest that the main branch was again, then we have a lot of systems, a lot of subhalos 
that are too dense to host any of the Milky Way dwarf toroidals, right? So this plot is too big to fail. However, if we take the same system, just pick a random realization, but now select halos by the stellar mass that they're assigned in that random realization here with two decades of scatter, then we're now throwing away a lot of our massive systems that are massive failures, right? I'll remind you that we're basically requiring that the number of halos is roughly equal to the number of galaxies here, because um, we're throwing away everything below our completeness limit, and anything that we say we're incomplete to cannot be a massive failure in this formulation. Um, so basically what we're saying is now these systems are not too big to fail, right? The big ones, even though they're massive, somehow they're failing to form stars. I'm not going to say why, I don't know why. All I'm saying is if we assume there's two decades of scatter, then we're able to at least alleviate this problem. So what does it look like on sort of a grander scale if we put all of our results together? This is essentially what we get. You go from of order eight to nine massive failures um, at the zero dex case, which remember has the best fit slope of about 1.8, um, to of order three massive failures in the best uh, case, which is about sigma of two, a uh, fan slope of about 2.6. If we also count up the fraction of realizations with no massive failures on the bottom panel down here, well, our solid lines aren't doing too much. They get a little bit better. But interestingly, if you just lower the Vmaxes of all of the subhalos by about 15% to say, we're going to pretend all their gas was ripped out and that's going to take some of their mass away, that that's not included in the Elvis simulations, which are dark matter only, then we get to about 25% of realizations not having any massive failures. That's pretty good, actually. We're not accounting for the local field, and we're not really accounting for M31, but that's still pretty good. So is there any observational evidence for this large scatter? Can we actually go out there and test whether this is true? Well, obviously we can't measure M halo, and we certainly can't measure M peak. Um, but there might be some indirect hints. So, for example, Coyle told you earlier uh, how she's finding the galaxies that are in low mass halos, below about 10 to the 9 in M halo, are universally quenched by reionization or by redshift 2 or so, but reionization processes. Similarly, the ultrafaint dwarfs that we know about also seem to be quenched by reionization. However, if there's this degree of scatter, then some of these ultrafaints ought to be living in pretty massive hosts that should be resistant to reionization quenching and might even be somewhat resistant to the quenching that Sean was talking about when they fall into their hosts. Similarly, um, there ought to be some of these uh, small ultrafaints that are living in really high Vmax dwarfs, and therefore they're completely unable to alter their density profiles whatsoever. So we should be able to find some systems that are really living in NFW-like hosts with pretty high velocity dispersions, even though they're very, very faint. Takana might be an example of that. Takana is very dense in this space, um, but it's probably much higher stellar mass than what we're actually talking about. So what about from the theoretical side? Is there any evidence from the theoretical side for this degree of scatter? Well, I told you I'd show you this plot earlier, so here it is. Um, this is just compiling a whole bunch of simulation results on dwarf galaxies from around the field. These are all using different prescriptions for feedback, different prescriptions for star formation, different prescriptions for cooling, um, well, aside from the same symbols, which are, of course, the same prescriptions. Um, as you can see, there's pretty significant scatter here, right? Not too surprising. These are all different prescriptions for everything. Um, and interestingly, we seem to be relatively well reproducing the upward scatter on the two decks uh, case that I'm highlighting here, on the black line, basically. Right, so that's good, because that's a scatter that alleviates too big to fail. However, the fact that this is empty is bad, because that's the scatter that lets us still match the counts when we have two decades of scatter. So in other words, there's nothing down here yet. Ultra-high resolution simulations so far are not reproducing this scatter, although it's also not totally clear to me that anyone's looking for that yet. I'd be interested to talk to people about that. So, um, I actually have extra time, so I get to read my conclusions. <laughs> Adding scatter to your M-star and halo relation will boost the galaxy counts at fixed stellar mass unless you also alter the slope of your M-star and halo relation. This also means that you require rapid fall off to avoid reproducing the local group dwarfs. If you're running simulations that you predict a lot of scatter in your M star M halo, 
you should not be pegging them to Peter Bruzzi's line. You should also not be pegging them to my line. You should be pegging them to something that goes a lot steeper. Similarly, uh, we're finding that about 25% of the Elvis realizations are without any massive failures when you select by M star, although I have no explanation for why um, so many of the massive halos have such low M star. That's uh, a problem for another day. Uh, but it's pretty impossible to directly test this hypothesis that sigma is about two decks. So we might need to look in star formation histories or maybe internal dynamics of as yet undiscovered ultrafaints um, to try to get some clues about this. And so there's also no theoretical evidence yet, but again, I'm not sure anyone's looking. Okay, thank you guys for your attention. We have plenty of time for questions, Joel. I have two different questions, both, I think, pretty sharp and, and short. Uh, you only mentioned Beruzzi many times and not mm -hmm. Moster. But Moster's uh, slope at the faint end, the, the low mass end, is much steeper, much that's more right. like what you wanted. Uh, and that's partly because he had a different comparison set. Uh, the second so the, the first question has to do with that. The second question is, uh, I think that there's something that you're not using that we've learned now from many simulations, including the Norby simulations. Mm -hmm. And also, for that matter, from the comparison that I saw first in the second of the Too Big to Fail papers and that you've repeated, which is that the faintest of the classical uh, dwarf seroidals are the ones with the highest circular velocities, namely Ursa Minor and Carina, mm -hmm. suggesting that okay. those are the ones that didn't have enough star formation mm -hmm. to bring down their central densities and velocities. You're not taking that effect into account at all. Why not? Taking into account, well, so let me, let me address the first question first. The, the Moster, um, Moster falls off probably, I, I don't actually have it on this plot. It's not as steep as a two dex case, but as you're right, it's, it's steeper much steeper than, Bruzzi, than Peter right. Bruzzi's case. Um, the reason I picked Peter Bruzzi is I already had it coded up. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the second question, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by taking into account. What I mean is, see, Abundance matching basically says that, aside from some scatter, you're going to rank order your halos mm -hmm. by either maximum circular velocity or peak circular velocity or peak mass or something like that, and rank order your galaxies by stellar right. mass and match them up. But if you've got a reason to think that higher stellar mass goes with lower velocity, which we do have reason to think, then that tells you that you shouldn't be doing your matching that way. I would say that I don't, I personally don't agree that we have reason to think that higher stellar mass goes with lower V max or M halo. I think we have reason to believe that it well, goes with lower V one half. Right, right. But it's unclear, you know, we need to nail down the profiles if we want to extend that statement out to the full halo. But you're not taking that into account at all. No, I'm not. Okay, maybe you should. That was my I'll comment. I'll think about how to do it. Frank gets the last question. So I was just looking at one of our old. 2009 conditional stellar mass function paper, and we have a slope at a low mass end that goes as m, well, in your language of alpha there, 4.5. Wow. Wickedly steep. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> mind you, neither Bruzzi nor Mosso know we have basically any constraints there. So mm -hmm. it's basically extrapolations. Um, but I was wondering whether we can actually constrain that. Now, the one problem that you showed is that you need to increase your scatter if you go to larger slope, but you're assuming a constant scatter. And okay. we know at least we have pretty good constraints that by the time you get it into the 12 solar mass halo, the scatter is not much larger than 0.2 dex. Mm -hmm. So have you tried a model where you actually make your scatter a function of mass so that, that increases have, with decreasing um, mass? And, and what can you reconcile then in terms of the slope? So I have tried that model. The qualitative results are the same. The quantitative results, I don't have yet. Are, are, I, you, are you willing to rule out something like, like, okay, the slope cannot be larger than some value, or you're, you're not willing to go there? I can't do that yet, at least. I can't say that yet. That's a good question, though. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Shay. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Santi Rojas.